Okay, Android people. Hello, hello, Android. Hello, hello world. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do today is plow through about five different PowerPoints because we're behind on PowerPoints. So what I'm going to do today is hit all the boring stuff so that Monday I'm going to come in we're going to go bang, bang, bang through projects. And I'll be able to... Hello. Hello. I'm sorry, I just can't talk over you. <laughs> Now that we're quiet, I'm going to start over again. <laughs> Today, PowerPoint after PowerPoint after PowerPoint. Monday, app after app after app. Because I have to give you all of the stuff that I'm going to show you on Monday. So, And this will catch me up because unfortunately I end up showing you more code than anything. Which is probably a good thing, but then again I can't get the concepts out. So, I don't remember how far I got with this Hello World. In fact, I don't remember how far I got with the PowerPoints because we really haven't looked at PowerPoints since day one. So what I'm going to do is just kind of plow through at the speed of light, stop when I find something I know I haven't talked about, and then we'll catch up today. And then Monday we will write some apps. You should have already done Hello World, by the way. Uh, this is something, this is review, actually. Uh, I just want to make sure I have covered it. And uh, the reason why you should have done it is because we actually went through the first assignment in this course, and we used Intense with it, so we actually went way above and beyond this PowerPoint. But in terms of creating a simple interface, we should have, and this is kind of review because I haven't seen you in about a week anyway. Uh, we looked at the XML interface. We looked at Hello World and creating a very simple application. We ran through the tutorial. You have Eclipse installed, I hope. We looked at, and this is the part I want to stop momentarily on just to refresh your memory here because this is important. If you don't know the Explorer, can you guys keep it down back there? I feel like I'm like, talking over people. <laughs> Hello? If we take it outside, if we take it outside, it's easier for me to talk. I'm sorry? Did you say something? No, I was trying to tell those people to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't, they're, they're, too, they're too busy. They can't hear me saying. I, I don't want to talk over you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Or you can take it outside if you want to continue. It's okay. All right, let's get back to this. All right, no, now it's really quiet. Uh, so here's the package content. This is where uh, one of the slides I kind of wanted to stop at. The rest of it I'm going to kind of fly through. We have to remember that we're going to keep an organization here. This is the same as what appears in the workspace directory for your particular project. Oftentimes, people start loading stuff. They put images in, and then they realize, oh, it's in the wrong spot. So, unfortunately, the only way to get used to it is just to keep practicing and to keep creating apps and to start looking at the directory structure and getting familiar. All of your Java code is going to be in the source directory. If you have a Java code file elsewhere, it's not going to run. It's not going to be, it's not going to find correctly. And it also has to be underneath the correct package name. If you start seeing multiple package names up here, you've made a typo at the top of your program and you've included the wrong package or you've cut and pasted and you put a file in that came from somewhere else and it had a different package name on it. When you start changing the package names inside of the files, the directory structure actually starts changing on you as well. So that could be kind of confusing. All the source is going to go into source. All the non-code resources, this is what the RES stands for, the resource directory. And as we saw last week and the week before, this is going to be automatically compiled and generated for you. What you see in here, however, are raw files. So PNG is a good image format supported. So is JPEG. Uh, that's a good one as well. All your generated code that links the resources to the Java code is in the r.java file. The r.java file is used as the intermediate kind of index for all everything that's in the resource directory. So if you create a menu, which we're going to see probably later in the slide sets, menus, layouts, everything, images, everything is going to be stored in the resource directory. If you just remember that. So the layout of the activity is stored in the layout. Layouts are the interfaces of the screens. So the strings that are going to be used, as we've seen before, this is review, are in the strings XML file. And then we have that Android manifest. The Android manifest is not in the resource directory, actually. It's outside of the resource directory. Um, I've had, actually, people try to reorganize this. Don't. And don't remove anything. <laughs> don't simplify. Don't delete keep it all because it all has a purpose. As I mentioned before, and this is kind of review as well in terms of the Android manifest, this is where we're putting all of our settings for the application. And we're using things such as the at string symbol. 
to say that we have this app name and this app name is a is a variable that we've actually set in the XML file for the strings and we get at these resources through the at symbol so we see the at drawable at drawable is actually referring to this drawable directory here we actually don't have to say drawable dash hdpi because we have like five or six different drawables depending upon what kind of support we want for different screen resolutions most people will put everything in the first one and the first one is going to be high definition uh, which is going to be the best quality and then it'll downscale uh, but you're using the same uh, notation but you're going at drawable and you're going icon well a drawable icon is the type it's the icon the labels, the string, app name. Um, here, the interesting thing is the dot that follows the hello Android, which is actually the name of the activity file. And that's the file that is up here, hello Android.java, where we've got the dot, which is kind of an interesting syntax. We leave the dot out, I believe, in most of the current Eclipse versions, it will work just fine, actually. Important to note whether or not you're using Eclipse or not, the manifest is the manifest that exists regardless of whether or not you're using an IDE. So you don't actually have to use Eclipse at all if you wanted to. You can have all of this stuff in your workspace, actually in any directory that you want. As long as it's organized this way and you try to compile it, it will work with the SDK. You don't actually have to. You can use Notepad if you want. We looked at this last week, and this is what we looked at, and this was the basic concept that was a part of the first assignment that we went over that you should have already completed at this point. And uh, what it was is was focusing on the activity and the life cycle of the object. Um, so the Android activity is focused on a single thing a user can do. So we have single activities. We have multiple activities and multiple activity classes per project. We don't have to have just one, which is kind of a, you know, a lot of people think, oh, there's just one activity. No, nope, you can have many. Most applications have multiple activities. Uh, what we're looking at here is a, this is actually kind of simple. You can put this together yourself. It's a tabbed interface where we've got a program that's running. This is just clicking on an icon. We have the first contact, second contact that's coming out of a contact. These are all different activities. This is just, uh, in fact, this looks like the, this looks like a contact program that comes with the phone, actually. Um, or we have phone call log. This everything when you when you click on it, you're switching between activities, which means you have a different life cycle that's going on. And as we saw before with the intents, one intent unloads loads another activity, and we switch back and forth between activities using the intents and the intents. Nothing more than something that we're specifying in the manifest that tells us to switch, go from one activity to another. Here we have an edit contact. This is just basically showing you how the screens are changing. So you might think of the activities as you know, if you're linking them to UIs, to XML files. Every activity is going to load a different U UI, and the UI is going to switch to give you that kind of application. And, and uh, in, in theory, that's how applications run on this phone, also on the iPhone. It runs in the same kind of way. Um, so it's very similar in concept. And so uh, we also did this. We looked at the uh, Hello World. This is a revised version of the Hello World, looking at inheritance. If you're in the Java class, you know what that means already. Um, so we have uh, imports, which are sort of like includes for C or C++, if you're familiar with that, importing here. If we don't put it here, we put it down here, as we saw before in the example I showed you last week. But uh, here we're looking at, and these, uh, these are nothing more than objects, actually. Objects, the text views an object, and I'm going to show you the UI interface and the hierarchy for this today. Um, so you can kind of see how these little pictures fit, how this whole big picture fits together, hopefully, after today. Hello World Android is extending. This is, this is ba if I left this off, this could actually be a Java application. In fact, uh, it probably could be. In fact, you can take a Java application, class you've written in Java for the first part, for the first class, convert it to an applet, actually, quite easily. What you're going to do is you have to extend something, to extend activity, perhaps. Or you, have to, you have to, because you, the class itself doesn't have, a, doesn't have a place in the hierarchy. There's no object. Instead, well, there is an object, but it's not the same in terms of the concept. When we extend activity, we're going to say we're going to follow the activity life cycle. It's a special life cycle that's set up for activities. And activities do nothing more than service up stuff for the user to click on and stuff. The onCreate 
is the constructor, if we remember that part. Um, and we're taking here the, and we went through this last week, so I'm not going to repeat it, all of it. The super dot on create calls the super on create. Uh, so the syntax is very similar. Um, text view TV makes a new instance of the object text view for this, calls it TV. I mean, you can actually do this in the first Java class, or you can actually leave this out if you want to. And you don't have to put this in here for this particular example. This is basically telling in this particular activity, <laughs> create a new instance of this object called TV. Um, some people like it, some people don't. I don't, personally don't like it. It confuses me. So TV does set text, set the text, and you're calling a method on this particular object. The interesting thing about this class, if you're taking both of these classes simultaneously in the Java class, you're creating your own methods. In this class, you're inheriting and you're using pre-existing methods. In fact, you don't have to create a text view. It's given for you automatically. So one of the things with Java, and you'll notice this with other things as well, we're using an API. So we have application programming interface to the Android phone through Java packages. Through pre-existing objects, we have an object for almost everything. And those objects, we're just making instances of those objects and calling methods on those objects. This particular object is a text view. And we've loaded it up, we've given it a name, now we're going to call it, and we're going to use it. So, set the context view basically says, you know, call this method set context view, which is inherited from activity that sets the context to the particular, and this is it here. This is the context that it was set to in terms of the screen, the main screen of the program. The layout, we looked at that already, and the layout's going to give us this. It gives us this particular interface is associated with the main.xml in this particular example, main.xml layout. We got that from, uh, well, we didn't load it in this example, but okay, we got that from, <laughs> we, we get that from the onCreate. We can set the context view to anything we want, in particular, we can set it to whatever XML file that we're going to use as our user interface. And so here we're going to set, and then what most people do is they look at examples. And that's why I sent you to the android.developer or developer.android.com. So you can look at those examples. Because in the examples, you're going to see the layout width, the layout height, the orientation, all of these. There's actually about a dozen or so more that you can set. Nobody ever sets them all. You set whatever it is you're going to need. If you don't set it, what ends up happening is you use the default. So if you didn't set orientation as an example and the phone was turned on its side, it was landscaped, then it's going to show up in landscape. If you set the orientation when the app loads, even though the phone is in landscape, it's going to put it in orientation of portrait or whatever, however you got it set, uh, which is kind of interesting. You can do some funny things with apps, actually, when you run them. Um, here we're going to set it by default into vertical mode instead of landscape or horizontal. Um, we can have the program... Let's say we're running it on a tablet and we want it to work on a cell phone as well. We can actually set the landscape to, we can set it to horizontal instead of vertical. Here's an example. We'll go into landscape mode and then it would come up and look a certain way. So, And uh, you can override what ends up happening in terms of the activities on the phone. Uh, in terms of someone trying to go hit the back button, someone trying to hit the home button. You can actually play with that stuff as well. Um, not recommended because you really irritate people. but. Uh, you can have different activities show up, and we'll see what the menu is. That's how we're going to, you know, have the menu automatically show up when the person hits the menu button, stuff like that. Strings we looked at already, and this is review, so I'm going to kind of go through this quickly as well. Um, the thing I didn't notice, the thing I didn't uh, point out when I showed you the string file was the opening and closing resource. We're actually defining the resource inside of the string XML file. And we're saying, you know, string name. This is actually sort of a variable if you think about it. It's an object called, you know, hello. And the hello is going to say hello world. And the object is called, you know, app name. And we're giving that a name. And we're using the opening and closing brackets. And this is something you'll get familiar with. This is the opening string. The name is going to be equal to this. Looks like HTML, acts like HTML. It's very similar to HTML. Um, so it's pretty easy, actually, for non-programmers because you're not declaring variables. You're not you're, you're using a mock-up, but instead of mocking up text to add color and graphics and stuff to it like HTML, you're mocking up the data and you're defining data components with it. And here's where we were setting the layout in the set context view. The previous slide actually didn't have this. <laughs> so um, R, we're wondering well, where R come from. Well, that's automatically generated as we know so far. R.layout.main is setting the layout view to that 
main.xml. We don't put the extension XML on the end of it. Instead, we just call it main. If we put a capital M on there, we get an error message. It's very case sensitive. So uh, you want to make sure you're using. In fact, it's very common to have everything in lowercase, uh, except for the objects. Objects are always in uppercase. String files, layouts, menus are all in lowercase. So you can tell the difference between the objects and the, uh, and the other comparts. Here's an example of what the r.java file looks like. And for the most part, you never, ever, 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 ever edit this file. Don't touch this file. But this is what it looks like if you're curious. If you touch it, if you edit it, your program's not going to work. It just doesn't work. It's not worth it. It's auto-generated for you. There's nothing you need to do about it. What this looks like, and hopefully and the reason why you're looking at it, is just kind of say, well, this is a Java class. Yeah, all that XML code gets converted to Java. <laughs> the entire program is written in Java. It's converted. So whether or not you're using Eclipse or whether you're doing it manually, you can still do the same process. You can still have it auto-generated. So Eclipse is just a basic, nice little way of automatically doing it for you, which is nice. Why people don't use Eclipse? I'm not quite sure. So. We run the program, it looks like that. We saw this last week, actually we saw a better one last week. Um, let's introduce a bug to see what happens. Unfortunately, what you don't get is a bunch of command line prompt, you know, exception in IO exception, or runtime exception, or this exception, or that exception. No exception handling that shows you graphically anything. Instead, you can do exception handling, and I'm going to cover this probably not till next week. Actually, probably not till the following week. It's towards the end of the course do I cover exception handling because it's not one of those must-have no knowledge things, but it's nice to know about it. If you introduce a bug, and here we're going to introduce a bug, and I'm going to say object 0 is equal to object O is equal to null, which is legal. O dot string, to string. Well, how can you send, how can you send null to, to string? You know, that, the, the code itself is nice. It works just fine, actually. It's legal code. Only problem is it doesn't make any logical sense, right? I mean, you can't basically convert null to a string. This is what you get. The application hello world. And you get the package it came in. Process com.example.hello world has stopped unexpectedly. Please try again. That's the most unfriendly error message you can possibly imagine. And you'll see this over and over and over again. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. No usefulness out of this at all. Unfortunately, this is what you get. So if you're running your first or second homework assignment and you're looking at this and you get this message, that means you have a syntax error. Or not a syntax error, you have a logic error. Because the syntax was correct, because the program actually compiled. But instead, you're doing something illogical, you're trying to convert a null object to a string, which is impossible. So you're doing something wrong. Unfortunately, you're never going to get divide by zero or uh, memory error or this exception or that. All the Java, all the Java errors are completely hidden from the user. Why? Because I have no idea. <laughs> Seriously, they could have actually put some output in here, but they didn't. So, unfortunately, this is the level of error checking you have. So instead, you put exception handling in there to put up toast messages. And I'll talk about toast messages in a few. But the toast message is nice. It's a little pop-up message that says something is null. Hmm, OK, or there's a problem with this, or there's a problem with that. So I know I'm kind of going, kind of going through this a little bit on the fast side, but because we've covered some of this stuff, and I just want to make sure I pick up the pieces of anything I may have left out. So this is technically the next lecture, Application Fundamentals. We've gone through this already. I want to revisit this concept, however, of the because this is the part that confuses everybody, usually. I don't know. Understand the applications and our components and the concepts of the activity versus the service versus the broadcast versus the content provider intent in Android manifest. Well, manifest we probably don't need to worry about. We know it's written in Java. This is the part I could kind of skip through. There's a good separation, corresponding security. Actually, we do know that the Android manifest is the security policy. Well, if you haven't worked with policy files for Java, you don't know what that means anyway, but it is the policy file. It's setting the policies for security. Um, so there's a separation of that. So each, and I've covered this already, but just to reiterate the point, each application runs in its own process. And there's only one process, and each process has its own separate virtual machine, actually. 
So the VM that we get on a computer, the Java JVM, actually can run multiple classes and multiple processes. On the Android, it only runs one. And each process runs in its own VM, which means we can't share information across multiple processes or multiple programs, which is why every program that runs runs in an island of its own. It's in a separate VM, which is why we use the content providers to exchange information back and forth. The database is not going to be shared between different applications, nor will files or anything else, actually. And you'll see that as we start writing more applications. Each application is assigned a Unix user ID that's associated with the user. By default, files of that application are only visible to that application and can be explicitly explored, exported. Yes, it can. You can, you can actually send the file out update, updated. And most of them, that's a little important note to actually to make, most of the file exchange is done through a shared server. So if you've got something within the application and you need to get it out, you use the internet access. <laughs> Send it somewhere, email it somewhere, post it to a server, have the other have the other process download it from a server. Something that's how chat actually works. We post messages to a common central server and then all of the processes actually pull it off of the server and get it that way. So here's our components and this is the part I sort of wanted to reiterate the activities most by default, every class you create will have extended from activity, if, especially if you create like a generic project type. It's the visual user interface focused on a single thing that the user can do. You can have multiple activities in each one of your Android programs. Each activity is generally associated with one single UI, so one single XML file. Um, services, there's no visual interface. They run in the background. You can have a UI. This is the interesting thing. So, you know, going back and saying, well, you said you only have one program, one process running simultaneously in the foreground. <laughs> you can create an app that has a service that runs, and you can bring it from the background to the foreground when you're using it. Or you can leave it in the background, and it can run as a service while you're doing other stuff on the phone. So services are usually referred to as background because there's no UI associated with it, but it's still the program. It's still the running process. Broadcast receivers receive and react to broadcast announcements. We haven't seen this yet, but as soon as next week, actually when we're going to run through like a ton of apps next week, especially starting on Monday, uh, which are going to be example apps, what we can do is a set a receiver to wait for incoming notifications, or excuse me, to look for notifications, or we can set the receiver to look for incoming messages and things, text messages, phone calls, you know, when your phone rings, putting up a little picture or something like that, we would actually create a broadcast receiver that waited for incoming, and it runs as a service. So, so a lot of these things kind of overlap and they're used in conjunction with each other to get the desired effect of what we're looking for. Content providers are what allow the data exchange between applications. They're called content providers, which is kind of a generic term. What's a content provider? Well, it's like the address book, <laughs> um, the phone log, the uh, all the services that the phone, everything is a, if it's not a, if it's not a background service, it's a content provider, essentially. The phone comes equipped with a bunch of that stuff, and we can use all that stuff. We're not sharing it in terms of passing it. We're opening it up and making an instance of the content provider. Everything we're doing is making an instance of objects, essentially. We're making an instance of it, and then we're using it as if it were ours, but it's not really ours. It's somebody else's. It belongs to the phone. Activity is the basic component for most applications, as we see. Most applications have several different activities that start one another as needed. And we saw that. We used intents, actually, last week to take one activity and start another activity from it by creating an intent. I mentioned it before, it was sort of like a pipe in Unix. This is a Unix process, so it actually is implemented. The intent sort of does create a pipe. Each is implemented as a subclass of the base activity class. So you're looking at an inheritance of activities, actually. We have the view. The view. Each activity has a different window to draw in it, although it is may prompt for dialogues or notifications, and we'll look at those. Oh, I'm going to have some dialogues for you on Monday, actually. The content of the window in a view or the group of views derived from the view or view group. I'm going to talk about views and view groups today. 
have not talked about those yet. Um, but I'm going to show you a hierarchy actually. And what we're looking at is the base view that's associated. And this is just the terminology for what you probably already know. The view is what you're looking at. <laughs> it's the UI concept. Um, iPhones, they call it storyboards. In Android, they call it the view. The view is the UI. It's the interface. It's what you're looking at. So you can have a view with a sub-view, with a group, view groups. You can have, you can divide the view out. The view can have multiple sections on the screen. The view can be on the bottom of the screen, top of the screen. It doesn't have to fill up the whole screen. One activity per view, normally. You can switch activities and also use the same views. So the view is kind of a separate concept. In you know, traditional style programming, we had a program. We had a user interface. <laughs> we used the user interface with the program. And it was all together as one unit. This is completely backwards. This is a bunch of views and a bunch of activities. And the activities work with the views and they call the views. And the views, nothing more than the UI input and output, which is kind of weird. Examples of views are buttons, text fields, scroll bars, menu buttons. And they're all universal for the entire program. It doesn't really matter. They're not attached to one, one class. We have view groups that are made up of visible view versus act, activity dot. We saw this before, set context view method. You don't actually have to put the word activity. It's sort of like this, actually. Activity is another word for this in this particular context because it's the activity that's running the context view. So most of the time, you just see it set context view with the view inside from the R file. As I mentioned before, services does not have a user interface to it. There's no visual interface. How does it run? It runs in the background indefinitely. We can start a server. We don't actually have to. We don't actually have to kill it either. And it's not, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with it either. Examples might be network downloads. Network downloads actually automatically run this way. Playing music. So our activity can start a service that starts the music player, M player, plays a file. The activity is come and gone, but the service is still running. <laughs> and your phone is still making noise. It's an automatic feature that happens if you create it as a service. If you don't use it as a service, don't create a service to run it in. Think of a service like, well, you have an activity that creates a service. The activity unloads, service loads. So if it's not running as a service, if it's running as another activity, activity ends, activity ends. It gets cleaned up. It's not going to be running in the background. So it's a special kind of activity we extend from service, essentially. We create a new service out of it. I have an entire lecture on TCP and UDP servers. This is where we're getting uh, the connectivity of the networking components. And don't worry about it if you haven't taken a Unix class, you don't come from a computer science background. Text messaging, good example. Chat systems, good example of UDP and TCP. What we're doing is we're sending packets and datagrams back and forth between servers and clients, essentially. So you can build, combine an existing service and control its operation as well. You can actually attach to and run the services of the phone as well. Broadcast receivers, as I mentioned before, receives and interacts with the broadcast announcements, aka, well, notifications are part of it, but there's more to it than that. Extends the class broadcast receiver. Examples of broadcasts. Well, what are broadcasts? Well, that's why I say there's notifications, but there's more. Low battery information, hmm? power connected, power not connected, shut down, shut on, time zone changed. Um, in the old days, I guess roaming, <laughs> but we don't roam anymore. Uh, but uh, those are different types of broadcasts. It's anything that the phone signals out and sends information. We can capture all that information and use it. Other applications can initiate broadcasts as well. So we can use other application broadcast information. That's interesting because let's say, for example, you have a program that only runs when the power is low on the computer. <laughs> then you can create the program as an activity, and it activity starts as a service. The service sits there and waits. It creates a new instance of a broadcast receiver. Broadcast receiver receives the activity. Hey, the battery is low. All of a sudden, the activity starts. And voila, there's your program. So rather than having the user click on an icon to run your program, and the program runs automatically, well, well, the same thing happens when a text message arrives or something, you know. Comes through the notification, notification wakes up from the service that you've started, wakes up the application. The activity starts, activity says, oh, what are you going to do with this text message? Let's re automatically reply back, sorry, I'm out of the office. <laughs> 
or something, you know, for an auto reply application. There's a couple of them out there that are really cool, actually. That auto reply to text messages. Sorry, I'm in a meeting. <laughs> And most people just answer their text anyway. So, all right, context provider, content providers, as I mentioned before, utilizes in uh, the information um, that is on the phone. Actually, in terms of address books, um, shared uh, information among different applications, makes some of the application data available to other applications. Not all application data is available. If you don't put it in the content providers and make it a content provider, and you can actually make a new instance of content provider and run the methods on that too. Add data to the con you can actually add to the contacts list in the address book as an example. It's the only way to transfer data between applications in Android. There's no shared files, no shared memory. Eh, called intents, sort of like pipes, but they're we don't actually have pipes. We have intents instead. It's all controlled by the API. Extends the class content provider, so we can actually create our own content provider if we want to. You know, my address book or something, or my content, which is how you're going to share app, how you're going to share data between different applications. And actually, some, some actually, some app developers do that, and that's the nice way of doing it. Others read and write files to the SD card instead. <laughs> so if you put the file on the SD card, and then the application goes and opens up the file, and then saves the file, and then another application. It's designed and knows where the file is. Can go ahead and open it, and close it as well. Well, the file problem is, is half these applications don't remove files off the SD card. <laughs> I'll write them, and then you uninstall the app, and lo and behold, the stuff is still on the SD card. So, clutters up the system a little bit. Content providers, you can actually read and write to, and get rid of automatically as well, or you can leave them, and they can clutter up your system as well. So. When you update the phone, your content providers and sometimes your SD card gets reformatted. <laughs> so it's not such a good idea, actually, to keep persistent data on the phone in terms of app development, which is why a lot of people put it elsewhere, put it on a shared server. Other applications use content resolvers, objects, to access the data provided by the provider. So a content provider creates it, resolver goes and gets it. Here's those intents, and we looked at the intents, and here's that PowerPoint I was supposed to give you before the intents, so this is today I'm catching up. <laughs> so We've seen intents in action, actually. So an intent is an intent object with a message content. We saw the messages, actually. We sent a message. We sent, what did we send? We had a UI screen that came up from one activity that said, enter your name. It was called Name Getter, and that created an intent, and it sent the name as a text string that came in from the text box to main or something like that or hello world app and it took the name and it put it on the screen so it was kind of simple but believe it or not that it kind of demonstrates the entire concept you send text messages back and forth between the application via the intents which is what that message content is all about we saw it with activities services and broadcast receivers can also they're also started by intents so we can create an intent to start a service and then we can create it to, basically, we can create it to um, start almost anything. Um, we, we, we started another activity with the intent. Content providers are started by content resolvers. So that's a little bit different. An activity is started by a context.start activity. And we did this, actually, with the intent. Or activity start activity for results, which means we're waiting for a code to come back. And it's kind of like the old days when we had returns and functions and things. Where we're waiting for something to come back. It's kind of like a you know fork a process. Did it does it come back? Was it okay? Because <laughs> when you're uh, starting an activity or starting an intent, or using an intent to start an activity, you don't know if it started or not. So this is the activity for a result. We just used the start activity. And a service is started uh, by the context start service. So start activity, start service, start send broadcast. <laughs> it's like pretty pretty uh, standard kind of naming convention that's being used. An application can initiate a broadcast by using intent uh, called send broadcast with an intent. So we can basically use intents with everything. So context send ordered broadcast or send sticky broadcast which means it's not in any particular order. It's like the differences between UDP and TCP, actually. Uh, one of them sends it in a predictable, managed order. The other one just tosses it out. The stickies just toss it out, actually. Don't actually manage to see if anything was received, because intents are sort of like, um, as again, kind of like a pipe, actually. You throw it through the pipe. 
throw through the channel and who cares if it makes it or not. <laughs> but we assume it's going to make it, so hopefully. Shutting down components. We didn't actually, do we finish that? I think we may have actually, no, we skipped this part. Um, an activity can finish on its own, actually, and give you a nice little normal error message that shows up. It says, oh, activity failed, stopped, unexpectedly. Well, that's kind of, you know, it was a bad message, actually. You shouldn't really see those from apps. In fact, what you want to do is finish the activity if the activity is supposed to stop. So, can terminate itself via finish. Can terminate other activities that started via finish activity. So if one intent, in fact, we probably should have added finish activity to our example we did because the name getter, maybe I did have it in there, I'm not sure, but name getter should have finished, which meant we started another activity. So let's finish this activity and replace this activity's memory space with that new activity. Otherwise, what you get is runaway and slow performance, runaway processes and slow performance. So you get one. Eventually, the VM is going to catch it and say, hey, unexpectedly gone away. Well, no, it wasn't unexpected. We did it on purpose. <laughs> but you don't want the user seeing that error message. Services can terminate via stop service. You can stop your service, essentially, especially after your service runs. For example, you have that little fancy text messaging auto reply system set up in place that sends everyone who tries to bug you while you're in your meeting. And your meeting is only 45 minutes long, so you set the time to, timer to 45 minutes. At the end of 45 minutes, you stop the service, stop the self. So it can automatically kind of turn itself off when you're all done with your meeting. So, and then we have content providers. They are the only active when responding to content resolvers. Otherwise, they're never active because why would you? It's a waste of resources, actually. And then broadcast receivers that are only active when responding to broadcasts. So a lot of stuff is only active when it's needed, actually. Uh, services for notifications and things of that nature have to always be active because that's. Know how they work actually you, you know you can't just have them run for five minutes and turn off <laughs> so so it's a uh, manifest itself and we actually kind of went through this already but just to reiterate the point its purpose in life is to declare the components in the system it's your configuration file if you remember that much that's enough the intent filters are in the manifest actually and they're called intent filters you declare intent filters they're handled by the current application in the manifest, and then basically they look like this. We've actually saw it with the name getter, and it shows essentially the activity. And here, the intent filter is, uh, let's say, for example, the main activity in the launcher, and then we have an, ooh, another activity that's, uh, you know, using an image or something. So it handles the image in some way in terms of uh, whatever it's going to be doing in terms of its intent categories. It's going to be default as well. So, long story short, you list out the activities that you're going to use, the services that you're going to use, the broadcast, whatever it is, the image, whatever it is that you're going to actually use with the intent. You actually, you're just telling the manifest, hey, it exists and it's okay. It's kind of like giving permissions. You know, it's like saying, hey, this file is okay. You know, we're good. If you don't put it in the manifest, everything works just fine, and you get one of those little, your app stopped unexpectedly. <laughs> that you know, and you, what happened with that? Same thing with permissions. We haven't seen it yet, but when we start using the internet, when we start using uh, things about the phone, you have to give permissions. Anytime you want to open a file, you have to have file I.O. permissions, internet permissions, GPS permissions, permissions to use everything. So it's like a, the manifest is sort of like a traffic guard. If it doesn't make it past the manifest, you get, your app died unexpectedly. <laughs> and it doesn't say anything about what was wrong either. So. All right, so I'm going to go through now and catch up with the graphical user interface information I was supposed to give you already. So the purpose of this lecture was to familiarize yourself with the GUI components, the layouts, the widgets, and the menus. And we've seen this already, and here's the view group I promised. And I have two more lectures that are on view groups specifically, because the nesting of the groups and the layering of the hierarchy is like the hardest thing. It's the easiest thing to do on the phone, but it's the hardest thing to design. <laughs> You think about it and what do you judge the entire application on the user interface so it's nice to have a nice flowing user interface not a technical concept it's more along the lines of uh, knowing the order in which things appear in so I talked about the view what I said we set the context view set context view to a view we're actually setting it to a starting place in the hierarchy we can set the context view anywhere we want actually 
We want to set it by default if we're going to run the program this way. We set it to the root node, which in our case, in this particular example, is going to be a view group. So all the hierarchy and the windows are arranged in a tree. We can start the tree anyway. We can set the context view to any node in the tree that we want. This is my point I'm trying to make. We can also have multiple trees, and we can nest the trees, and we can put one tree inside of the other tree if we want, depending upon what we're doing when we load the trees. We all of it's controlled by the set context view in the activity, which is the last line usually of on create, which sets the context view. In this particular example, we have a view group inside the view group. We have another view group inside of the view group here. Instead of a view group, we just have a view. Well, the only thing different between a view group and a view is that the view group holds multiple views. <laughs> so we can't put a view group. We can't put a view group inside of a view. It's usually the other way around. It's usually a view inside of a view group. So think of it that way. Uh, and we have a bunch of views that go inside that view group right there. And this is kind of the, uh, the concept displayed in terms of some components that are loaded inside. And we can't really see the hierarchy here, actually. But this is what this picture here has this hierarchy over here, actually. It's pretty much describing that UI. So let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail in terms of the layout. It all starts with the layout. And your outermost XML, lay XML component is the layout. By default, everything has a linear layout. Linear layout is like a line. It's like a typewriter goes scrolls from one line to another. Inside the linear layout, we can put, and we don't have to have a linear layout. We can change the outermost layout. We can change the default. And then XML, we create a new menu create a new, excuse me, uh, main XML interface UI. We always get linear. We don't need to use linear. We can use anything we want. We can change it to relative layout. What I'm going to do is kind of go through all those different layouts. So layout defines how the elements are positioned relative to each other, next to each other, underneath each other. In a table, in a grid, you have different layouts for each of the view groups. So you can have a layout inside of a layout and you can have a layout inside of a view or a layout inside of a view group. So here we have this particular case. We got a layout. And then we can have a layout, layout parameters that are set for a relative layout. Inside the relative layout, which is inside of this layout, we have a couple of views. Inside of the views, we have three different relative layouts that we're setting. So we can change the relative layout relative to the view. It's kind of a twist on words, I guess, but when we don't have to have the same layout for each level in the hierarchy, we can switch the layouts around. And we can nest different layouts inside of layouts. So inside of the layouts, we have, and the only way you know about the layout, the only way you can get a, kind of get a feel for the layouts, and, this, and actually this example, if I showed you the GUI for it, it wouldn't make any more sense than this example, actually. Because when it's a pattern, you have to decide, well, okay, this is the main screen, and what you're doing is you're kind of subdividing the screen, perhaps. And you're saying, I want a menu on the top. So you're going to create a layout for that. And then I want another menu underneath it. So you're going to nest another layout inside of it. Maybe these layouts are going to be on the same level. And then you're going to say, well, okay, inside of this layout, I want another layout. You don't actually have to start out with a layout, though. You can take this big old layout, only use one layout, and put a view group in there. If you do a view group, what ends up happening is all of the components that are nested underneath are formatted for the group, and the group is treated as a whole. So you can implode the group, you can switch the groups around. So this is how you're getting most of the fancy functionality of your apps. <laughs> it's this is a hundred percent. This is like ninety percent of your programming effort that everybody sees. Nobody cares about your source code. But they want to know what your app looks like. These are, you know, especially if you're doing game programming, if you're doing, you know, you're adjusting. You, you want to make, you know, special effects where you've got a, you know, a bunch of images that are all in a row, and the user clicks on the images, or the images are perpendicular, and they, you have a map, and the person touches the map, or so all the interesting GUI behaviors all controlled by the layouts and the view groups and the widgets that are on the view, which unfortunately. It's the easiest thing to program because you just da drag and drop and stick stuff on a canvas. But it's the hardest thing to actually design unless you happen to be a graphic designer. So, and even graphic designers, unless you don't know the terminology, it's going to be hard. So one of the things you'll need to do is decide, well, not necessarily which widgets, but which 
what what yeah. areas. I'm thinking we got one. This is probably one, two, three, four sections, perhaps. Probably would look better actually if you cut it in half. You put like I would put like a I make this probably a relative layout and stick two more like stick like maybe four layouts inside of it and do two different view groups. Because then you can control what's visible, what's not visible. You know, when the application comes on, the user clicks on enable. Well, I want disable to turn off or something. And then all of the different GUI effects are controlled either easily by the way you have it arranged or individually or, you know, it could become a challenge. So they call them widgets. These are all the view objects, the view objects, examples, or text fields, edit fields, buttons, check boxes, stuff like that, radio buttons. So UI events, as we saw before, are done by the listeners. So we create the view group. In fact, that's the other thing, too. So you could put a listener on a group. So if you touched radio button A, B, or C, <laughs> and we're going to do something, we're going to highlight, we're going to select number one, and we're going to deselect two and three. So a lot of this stuff you take for granted in like Visual Basic or I don't know, like some of the GUI, you know, when they have plug and play, you know, drag stuff over. That stuff's a little bit easier, I think, actually, because this you have to actually manually control. And then you gotta stick your listener on the right view group, on the right group, actually, or on the like uh, widget. Usually handled by defining a listener on the forum. So on something, listener, I uh, register with you register it with the view. So on this particular view, uh, which happens to be this main screen here, on the text field, or on the button click, or on something, you know, on entry of text into a field, put this listener, and this listener is going to essentially do something uh, when something happens. So for example, an on-click listener for handling clicks on a button or a list. On touch listener for handling touches, which is kind of interesting. So you have a map, let's say for example, and you and the user touches the upper left hand corner. It's a menu item. Yeah, it's kind of. This reminds me of website development, actually. You know, when people put images out there and you press something on the image or you click something on the image and it picked up image maps. You know, if you're familiar with that, same concept. <laughs> so. On a touch, on a key, on a, on a button press, there's a ton of these. You learn these. In fact, these are the three common ones, actually, because most people just put buttons out there. You know, I can play around with images. Alternatively, you can override existing callbacks if we implement our own class extending a view. About the last week of the class, I'm actually going to show you an example that implements your own click listener. And this is a hold it down and move it to the right, then move it to the left, and it does something. <laughs> You need to do that. You need to know how to do that in order to do games and stuff. You know, it's like, put it in a circle. You know, that's a different event than, like, move it to the left, fast to the left, fast to the right. You know, if you're playing a game and you've got your finger on there and you're doing certain motions, you got to create your own, you have to create your own listener class to pay attention, identify that event that's occurred, and then react to it. Once you do that, you can do any type of app development you want. Actually, the, the UI event is, is, is a piece of cake after that. And that's actually not hard at all. That's really easy. Actually, it's pretty easy to do that. I think about it. Maybe I'll bring that in next week. <laughs> so I have to load up a bunch of examples on my computer because Monday we're going to go through tons of them, hopefully. And I'll make them available so you can download them and take a look at them as well. But uh, I, I, I like to teach through example and just go through a bunch of them and then you can kind of show you PowerPoints, okay for concepts, but to actually do it, it's a little bit different. So Menus. I haven't really looked at menus yet, so next week I'm going to show you menu examples. Menu examples, you have three different varieties. And the three different varieties come with options menus, contact menus, and submenus. Options menu. When you click on the options button on the phone, you get, there's a menu button on your phone. That's the options menu. <laughs> You can programmatically create an options menu in the code. You can actually take and uh, create an options menu using the Android SDK thing and says, you know, you, you know, new HTML, new XML screen, oh, options menu. You know, you can do it that way. You can create a menu, put it in a menu folder. You can load it in many different ways. I like to do it programmatically, actually, because then I can control it. Then you can put listeners on the option menu events. So let's say the user clicked on, um, and the, the menu just shows up on the bottom. You can't change that behavior. Um, let me rephrase that. You can change the behavior. It's too much work. 
you're just going to take it as is and use an option. Because if you're going to move it around, you might as well just do a submenu from that. So this is a pop-up context menu that comes up in terms of, uh, you know, when you press, let's say you have a list of items that are on the screen. In fact, this is a, this is a submenu from this context menu. Uh, it could be. I don't know if it is or not. But press a hardware, get you the options menu. You press a long press, and this context menu shows up on the screen. I'm sure you've seen it on some apps before. You press on this long press on this item here, and this sub-menu shows up, another menu. These are more popular because they're more controllable. You know, <clears throat> they come up in terms of click events or press events or hold events or swipe events. You can have the menu come out, you swipe your finger across the phone, and the context menu comes up. It says, what do you want to do? So you're going to control the UI. It's not, it's different, it's a similar but different than the old MFC where you had, you know, a file menu, open menu, <laughs> the drop down menu. It's a kind of a similar, but you have these three choices essentially. This one is a derivative of this one. This one comes up when you press on a context menu item or an options menu item, you can get a sub menu to show up. Sub menu is just nothing more than a, in the hierarchy, it's further down, it's another menu. They all have the same features, they all have the same functionality, you can do the same thing with all three. It just shows up differently. So, which is where your changes are. So menu items has zero or more menu item has zero or more and menu items has zero or more menu items. So the sub menu is the sub menu. You can actually pull up the same sub menu from different menus as well. And you can get it, you know, from the options. You actually could take the same menu and have it work with all everything <laughs> if you want to, which a lot of people do actually, because you know your users may not be that intelligent, you know. You might just want, you know, whatever they press, this menu is going to come up and say, hey, dummy, you have to put your name first, you know. <laughs> so we can control what the user is doing, so. All right. Views 1 and Views 2, and then we're done for tonight. <laughs> and you're like, this is a lot of PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, but you're going you're gonna to see this. You're going to see this on. Hopefully you'll remember some of this by Monday. <laughs> and then I'm going to go through and show you this stuff programmatically and then you're going to go, oh, give me the PowerPoint back. <laughs> Alright, so here's the layouts and the widgets and the menus put together in terms of putting the pieces and the concepts together and to form the GUI components. So got all this lecture in this two parts, Hello Views Part 1 and Part 2. And I'm going to stop after Part 2 because that's going to be information overload. But here's our linear layout. As you can sort of see it. What we've got going on here this is what we look like over here. We're just essentially lined up. And we're going to word wrap if we run out of space in the column. So it goes by rows and columns, believe it or not, on a linear basis. And the code for this particular, so I'm going to try to make this as big as possible, but still make it so you can sort of see it all on one screen. This is the code that goes along with this. So if you wanted to, you can cut and paste this, put it into a Hello World Power, a Hello World's uh, Android app. And sort of see what this looks like. We're doing nothing more than creating, uh, using orientation here to vertical up here, and then we're we're still using orientation. But here's where we're getting our row one, our row two, we're using a 15 point font, changing the font size, and it's all inside of a linear layout. And then we have two linear layouts. We have one linear layout here and one linear layout here. So we actually have a hierarchy here because we can see the opening and closing linear layout here where we're filling in uh, uh, the colors for the top with one inch columns. Which is, this is the outer one. So we, in order to do this, a lot of people like to indent. This is a really bad example because it's not indented. But in order to actually kind of see the hierarchy, it's probably not a bad idea to get in the practice of indenting your layouts. So that way you can kind of see which is inside of which layout. Because like looking at this code, you can't really tell that there's two layouts inside of a main layout. So, But here's one of the layouts you can tell by the opening and closing tag. Here's the other layout here. And in both of these two layouts are inside of the big layout. So that's actually kind of normal. Um, we have one set to vertical. Actually, they're both set to vertical. <laughs> one's doing this, one's doing that. We can actually take it, if this were in an Android project, click on the bottom of the layout and make it bigger if we wanted to. We can actually change the width of the columns. We can change the items uh, through the mouse GUI interface if we want to as well. 
We don't actually have to do it programmatically. A lot of people prefer to do it this way by setting, you know, width and height and, you know, and if you see relative, you're going to say, you know, this item relative to that item and above this item, below this item kind of thing. Because it's easier than trying to, because that screen is kind of small, that little gooey thing. They put it in there for people to, you know, mess around with, but it's kind of small, not very user friendly. So, if we were to do it programmatically, what we did, and we've seen this already, we click on the layout button down here in the bottom, and we see it, we see the screen here, we click on the XML file down here, and we see the code here. We're familiar with this already, so I can kind of skip through that a little bit. So this is one layout with two different views that are associated with the one layout. I'm going back to the view concept. This is what's considered the view, actually. <laughs> it's, you know, is it a layout? It's two layouts inside of a layout, but we have two views in one layout. So it's the terminology. It's one layout with two views in it, but the two views are created by layouts. So, okay. That was the linear layout. That's the one we've seen so far. We have no control over the linear layout. Everything is word wrapped from one line to the next. This is the one that I prefer. It's called the relative layout. And if you want to, in fact, every project I do, I do in a relative layout. Because what ends up happening is you'll get familiar with how to make it work. <laughs> because in the first linear layout, it's really hard to make that work. It's, it's word wrapped. And then you end up putting spaces in there and, you know, blink blank widgets in there so that you can spell up space so you can kind of get it word wrapped correctly. Relative puts GUI elements, widgets, in relative relation to each other. So in here we've got uh, type here is the label and then we can say um, layout below the label. This, this one here is going to be the edit text. This is that field here which is below type here which is the label. Um, actually, it's a text view, calling it a label. It's, the la it's called label up here, but it's uh, the layout, you know, below this one. So we're basically telling it, you know, below this one, below that one, to the margin, to the left margin, to the left margin plus a certain... Uh, we have a lot more options that we can do to put this in. It's relative because we're putting components in in relationship to other components, which seems a bit illogical at first, but this is my favorite. This is the best layout I think that exists. If I have a choice, I'm going to use a relative layout. <laughs> it just makes it easier. Unfortunately, though, you don't necessarily need to use a relative layout. There's other choices. So, And the way you learn this is not by looking at a PowerPoint, by actually creating a relative layout and then setting the height and the width and then putting components on there and putting them in relationship. The interesting thing, however, is you can take the components and drag them, and the relative information changes. So the, the view is controlled by the layout, and the layout will change with, you know, like, if I drag this over here, drag it over there, this code will change to give me. So sometimes I can kind of take it, position it, and then change the code to move it over, or move it to the left or to the right a little bit to get the spacing correct. Table view is also a good one, very useful. Because inside of the table view, you can put other layouts, which is nice. So the t table view is good. This looks like a table. It actually looks like an HTML table where you can have rows and columns. This one just has uh, rows, no columns. Actually, there's two rows, but we don't have lines that are showing. Excuse me. Yeah, we do have two, two columns, but we don't have the lines. So we have, uh, this might look familiar, it kind of looks like HTML, actually. We have a table row. In the table row, I have a text view and another two text views in the table row. And here we have another table row. And we have, whoops, another table row, another table row. And then we have the another view in the bottom. The view is going to be essentially something that's going to show a picture, maybe, or I don't know, it's going to show something else. The table row comes in handy when you want to show rows or columns with or without lines. Use the same as a table in HTML. In terms of the table layout, here's one activity, per t excuse me, the tab layout. So remember that first screen I showed you, and people are like, oh, wow, nice. It's actually kind of simple. You just put in a tab layout. Tab layout, and you define tabs. Same way as you define in the table layout where you define rows. Put tab number one, tab number, actually it's not, it's the, there's no numbering to it. You just say tab, 
title, <laughs> and then you put in the different parameters that you want on the tab. So here we have artists, album, songs. Underneath the tab, we can put another layout in here for linear layout or something. So we can create a new project here. And this particular thing is going to run you through creating a tabbed project. So one activity per tab, and you can create a new project, Hello Tabs, and put each activity in each one of the tabs. So when you click on the tab, you can put in a little click event in there, and it runs a different activity. So it's a nice way of dividing out your UI, which is kind of different when you start thinking about, well, what's the difference between mobile device development and application program development for a computer? You don't really think about the UI as much, I don't think, because this is all UI driven. That's why I was going to say it's kind of the hardest part of programming in mobile devices is figuring out how you want to design that UI. So here it's very common. In fact, I have, a, I have an example I'm going to try and bring you on Monday. I remember. Actually, I'm just going to take all of them and load them on my computer so I can just pick and choose which one. Someone remind me, I have a really good tab example <laughs> where you click on the tabs and I'll make them available for you so you can download the examples. You click on the tabs and it loads a new activity and uses an intent actually to switch between the activities. I also have a nice table example as well. <coughs> In terms of creating the application that's going to run this, the slide actually goes through it. I'm going to bypass it. I'm not going to do it because we're going to we're going to do something else on Monday with this. But we can create uh, three new activities by creating new classes because that's what an cl activity is. It's a Java class that extends activity. So you right click on a Hello Tabs package name, new class. Same thing as creating a class that we've done already when we created the name getter class in the Hello World program. Right click on the new source override implements, click on on create. So the thing you're looking at here is that it's a subclass uh, activity. It's going to basically create an, a new activity class. And you're going to call the activity class here. And here's how you would call the activity <laughs> class. So this is the each one of the different classes for those three different tabs. So you fill in the on create method to load in the XML file that's associated with each one of the tabs. So it's a quick and dirty way to, you know, by hand like Hello World to kind of create a nice fancy looking application. You can actually do Hello World like this. In fact, you can put the name getter on one and then you can put the main one on the other one. But instead of like pressing OK, instead you click on the tabs actually and it would switch between the different activities, which is the same kind of event driven behavior. So in here we have our extending activity. This is the same as before. On create, you know, text view, text view. This artist tab is you're going to set the text. The text view set the text to this artist tab, which shows up. This is the artist tab <laughs> that shows up on the bottom. And because this is a separate layout, this can change. This still stays the same. So it depends on the on click event that's running, and you have the you have the same event running for each one of the tabs. You click on one of the tabs and it changes the lower part, keeps the higher part still intact. And you're going to set the context to the text view that's going to be associated with the lower portion. So you copy and paste the artist tab into two more activities. You call it the album tab and the so uh, songs tab, songs activity, and you basically can create that application quite easily. But I'll show you the code on Monday actually. Um, copy the icons as well. You can do that actually. Uh, the tabs are showing icons. In fact, that's kind of easy actually because the icon is in the code, in the code that creates the tabs. <laughs> so you copy and paste the icons, you put them into a folder, you have to put them in the resource folder actually. And then you tell the tab to load this icon. You can do this for same technique for menu items. So the context menu can have icons on it. The options menu can have icons. Everything can have an icon on it done the same way. What you're doing is you're loading it into the resource drawable. You move the icon. You just, this is basically showing you to drag and drop the icons in. Um, kind of like how we, uh, uh, I'll show you that I guess. I'll go through that example as well on Monday. You just drag stuff in. I think I've done that already. I think I may have done it with an icon for the application or something. But anyway, you're just dragging and dropping and putting it into the folder. And then you're telling the code, and here's the code here, actually. This is in the IC tab artist.xml file that's loading it. Um, you're saying here that the item, the Android drawable, is going to be equal to this one here or that one there. These are the different 
image files that you have um, put over there. And then the selector here is the state list drawable object that displays different images. It's just another tab, excuse me, tag, XML tag that's created that gives us the selector for the tabs. So I'll show you. Actually, I think I might even have this one created, actually. Uh, but you can probably do it yourself kind of easily. Make copies of the XML files, yeah, so you can actually basically reduplicate all your efforts in each one of the tabs <laughs> without having to, or create new XML files for each one of the tabs if you wanted to. Call them different things, so you can call the different, actually, you know, it makes no sense if you call the same XML file for each one of the tabs, so make some different ones. And then here's what the layout actually kind of looks like. So we have the linear layout that's on the bottom here. Inside we have a tab widget, this is the this is the component here, it's called a tab widget. It sets the ID tabs, fills up the parent part of the sub linear layout. So we have a two, we have a frame layout on the bottom that we're going to use uh, for the bottom portion of the screen. The frame layout, so what we do is we take in the layout, what we're going to do is we're going to load different things in there. So we're going to load different XML fi files that go into the layout, which is kind of interesting. That's why I say it's not, this is why the view groups and the views <laughs> it's kind of like the most trickiest part because then that gives you the user interface you know, that gives you the functionality of everyone says oh cool app you know it's all XML <laughs> none of it has to do anything with Java programming so uh, but uh, anyway this is kind of a you know tab host is the main component inside we have layered layouts and we have layered components that we're going to put in there so and then the on create for the hello tabs activity here. Uh, if we take a look at the, the details of it, we're sending the activity to the tab activity, which has a tab host. And so the tab we're making it we're doing it programmatically here. It's the same way as you get at text boxes, at input boxes, and components, buttons, and things. It's the same thing. We're going to create a tab host. Tab host. It's going to be get the tab host, <laughs> which is going to essentially get the activity tab host. And then uh, take that and um, put it into a temporary object that you're going to manipulate and you're going to run some uh, methods on. And as I was mentioning before, and lo and behold, we're going to use an intent to switch between the tab activities. So each one of the tabs has an activity associated with it. And when we click on the tab, a new intent is created. The old activity is closed, finished. The new activity is loaded. It's all loaded in the lower part of the relative layout. Actually, it's a linear layout that's on the bottom of it. Or, uh, Actually, it's a frame layout, I believe, that's put on the bottom of it. Don't worry about the code at this point, but the concept is what you're looking at in terms of um, what it is you're designing. And uh, like 99.9% .9 of all applications, this is essentially the most work of the design. It's figuring out how you're going to set the layout. The builder mapping the resources to the tab. And this is basically initializing it, setting the information. And if you run it, it kind of looks like that. So this is the same. This example, actually you can cut and paste the code out of this example and it works. But uh, I think I have it already created for you. But uh, you click on the tabs and it just shows another screen down here. It says, it's just a label actually that changes on each one of the XML pages. But the, in the frame layout, actually you're just loading the XML pages. They basically show. In fact, you can do that with a web page. You can do that with a map page. The web view and the, um, the map view are the same actually. But one loads a map, the other one loads a web page. And it's just dragging and dropping and stretching it out, making it look good. And then you click a button and now oh, you have the internet. <laughs> you have a website loaded or something like that. So the list view is a little bit more complicated because there's more programming to it. But the list view shows you, and this is what you see automatically. In fact, it's about the same level of programming you get with the uh, iPhone as well, to create a list view. In fact, this concept is identical, which is nice because once you learn how to do it on one mobile platform, the other one is very similar. In fact, all of the views pretty much have the same naming convention to it, except for you don't have the layouts. Instead, you have storyboards, which is equivalent to a layout on an iPhone. You can nest storyboards, or you can nest, you can nest layouts. So the list view looks like this. this. is common. This is more of an iPhone kind of interface. There's a list of scrollable items. If you push your, you know, your finger up, the whole thing scrolls up and down, kind of like an address book kind of thing. Application will inherit from list activity rather than activity. So you create 
the uh, XML file, instead of it an activity running it, it's a list activity. The list activity is setting the view components so you can create a list item, XML, this is the layout for it. For each one of the items, when you click on one of the items, you have an uh, on-click listener that clicks an item. So item clicked identifies which item was clicked, brings up another XML page for each one of the items. And the XML page can be populated dynamically with whatever content is supposed to be on that item. So you might have like a text box or a label or something that shows information. Or maybe it's a edit for the form or something, or something that controls each one of the items. So there's what kind of looks like overriding the onCreate method. Uh, what do we have here? We have list activ where did my mouse go? Here we got list activity up here now instead of activity. So the stuff in black is the new stuff. Public class hello list extends list activity. On the on create, here we're setting it up. So we have uh, a list adapter. So we set instead of the context view. So in a uh, activity, we set the context view, which is a method that we're running. Set context view on activity. So for list activity, we don't have set context, we have set list adapter, <laughs> which is a similar method. And most people go, well, how in the world do you know which method belongs to which inherited class? You just, it's all the same stuff over and over again. So once you've used it once, you get familiar with it, and then you can start using it again. But uh, here we're setting, uh, setting up the list for this application with this layout and this content. <laughs> so... We have this, which is the first parameter, because we can actually set it for another layout. So when we click on something, when we have a list show up, we can actually set something to occur elsewhere. It doesn't actually have to be on the particular, we can load a different layout if we wanted to. But r.layout, this is the XML file, and we're going to set it to countries, which is one of the items, essentially. And what we're doing is just creating a new array adapter. And this is actually an array so that when we click on from the list, the, the list adapter, we know 0, 1, 2, 3, we know which element by its numbered order which was clicked. So we can populate that information into the correct subscreen that's going to come out of that or submenu. Oops. And uh, it enables filtering by the keyboard here. Uh, don't worry about that at this point. Um, for items click, so you can actually use the up and down arrows instead of the manually the thumb arrows and stuff. Um, so here's a here's an important part to set the on click listener so it knows on on click item so each one of the items that's clicked you see on item clicked I'll set it backwards it knows the parent it knows the view adapter view from the adapter view it knows the, the view inside of it the position and the ID uh, which is going to say you know you know, it's the first item, it's the second item, the third item, essentially. Um, and what you're doing is you're just going to set the behavior and the rest of the code that's kind of missing, actually, from this example, to do something. Instead, this is just going to basically pick it up and not do anything with it. And here's an example of that little toast message I was talking about before. The toast message shows a small little piece of text, actually. It's like a pop-up window. It says, hey, hello, you know, then goes away. You can actually set parameters. This one uh, is using... Uh, you can do short, long, medium. You can actually set the number of seconds, or milliseconds, actually, as well. Um, each one of the methods actually has got tons of different parameters, or method calls you can do on the object itself. Uh, but why are they called it toast? I don't know. Maybe because it pops up, like from a toaster? I don't know. <laughs> it's just a pop-up. It's a pop-up window. It's not really even a window. It's a mess. It's actually, here it is down here. I'll show you toasts, actually. We'll create some toast messages one day as well. So, here's two items. You click, on, oops, you click on one of the items, and you get this toast message that shows up. And the toast message is going to have the get text from the view, from the text view that's inside of the, of the uh, list, list activity, or excuse me, list box, or whatever, list adapter, bleh, <laughs> that's in there. So... So it knows which one you've listed on, you've, you've clicked on, essentially. This is what everybody likes from the iPhone, actually. It's a date picker. We uh, will display a dialog that you just create a new object called a date picker. It displays a dialog box allowing you to change the date, essentially. So 
you know, can basically scroll through each one of the items and set it or cancel it and basically changes the date up here. So change date, click on that and just kind of call the date picker uh, widget. And here's the date picker widget inside of, uh, we have the text view up here on the top. We have the button here and then we have the date picker that's uh, going to pop up essentially. So it's a matter of just arranging the components together, essentially. So, and the idea is to pick a date from the button, so change the date. So. And then on the on create for this particular application, if we were putting this together, what we would do is uh, make a new date here, and this is actually where the date picker actually comes into place. Where we uh, add a click listener on the button, so then on the button it sets up a show dialog, and the show dialog is the date dialog ID. Which actually kind of brings up a good point as well, and I'll show you dialogues, which in the menus, the submenu is really a dialogue from a context menu that brings up another menu. Um, and, and this is really a dialogue. It's a special form of a dialogue. You can set up other dialogues that have OK, Cancel, that have A, B, C, D. And uh, it's a matter of just creating the widget itself. Most of these widgets are done programmatically. This one is not in the layout. You click on the change the date. In the on create method, on the on click listener for the change the date button, we're going to create a new instance of this dialog, and we're going to show this dialog, and the dialog type is the date dialog. So we're going to essentially pick an existing widget that it, you know that's part of a dialog sub hierarchy. So we have alert dialogs, we have info dialogs uh, that we can show. Um, so I have a uh, Another example on dialogues, actually, that I'll show you as well. Um, hopefully, I'm just going to load everything on this computer over the weekend, so <laughs> I'll have it all. Um, and this is what have we got here. Uh, this is getting the current date, actually, guess getting the month, the day, day, and the year from uh, the dialog box uh, that we have put up. So we're capturing the information, we're sending the information back. The interesting thing about the dialogues is you don't have to use an intent, actually. The information from the object is available, even if the object's not visible, you can still pull it from what the object was set to. And you can actually set the information on the object before the object is actually shown, so the dialog here can actually have the current date actually set on it, um, instead of any random date. So. I'm not going to go through this code because it makes no sense to you right now, probably, but uh, this is just setting the format for the text box with the month, day, and the year, putting a adding a string with uh, lines in between, separated out. So the date picker dialog, we have the on date set listener, as you might imagine, just like an on click listener when you set the date to do something differently. So it could change some other GUI item or it can essentially have some customized behavior associated with it. Um, so on the date set, it's going to save this information to the local data members that are part of that class probably. So. On create dialog, which is the method essentially to create dialog window. We have uh, the dialog on create dialog, which is what we're overriding to say that we're going to, on the case of the date dialog ID, we're going to use the date picker for it. We can actually return, we can actually set, we can change this to do on create for anything, um, any type of dialog, depending upon what we've got created or what we want to create. If we run it, we looks, it looks like this, essentially. So. And last but not least, only one more. <sighs> and it's PowerPoint overload. <sighs> but at least if I show you all this stuff now, and we start looking at at least you know the concepts, hopefully. Get familiar with the concepts, and we'll see it programmatically, and you go, oh, dialog box, context menu, options menu. I know there's a lot of pieces in here. This stuff is the easy part, though. This is the fun part. So this is, last but not least, all of the different view components. <laughs> so we have hello form stuff. Uh, so on the form, this is the easy stuff, though. The radial buttons, edit buttons, check boxes, toggle buttons, rating bars. The stars come up automatically. In fact, when you click on the stars, you can capture the event on how many stars were clicked, which stars were clicked, and get half a star clicked. It's the same activity you get on an iPhone, actually. For a custom button, we can put, and this is the custom button here, actually, we can put a checkbox on We can add an image to the button. 
we can put a, this is the line here where we click the button and it highlights the little line or something, um, you know, does certain stuff. And it's just basically doing, uh, you know, chat, you know, on the state pressed is true, on state focused. Um, we can actually have some events, not, not on the slide, but some events where you put the mouse over something and something highlights. It's kind of like website design when you put your mouse over a menu and everything changes color. Um, or you, you know, you hover your hand over, you touch something, and it changes color or something. But that's more of an on-touch event. We don't really have a mouse in a Android environment. Uh, but here's our button. It's just showing us. Uh, we can put an image on the button itself, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then, um, what is this? Oh, this is just going to set up a toast message, beep, bebop, or something like that when you hit the button. The on the on-click listener is set for the button. Uh, so that on and on and click, it's just going to put up a toast message, essentially. And then we have a edit text field. This is just going through. This is the button, actually, that has the image on it. And the next couple of slides are going to go through all these little items here. <laughs> so you can download the... Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, it's going to be further down. It's going to be the second. It's going to be this guy here. So vibrate on, vibrate off. So this guy here is on this slide. This guy here, this edit text, is this guy here. This is the t this is the code that correlates corresponds to each one of the buttons. So this edit text, so checkbox. I'm not going to go through all the text. Instead, I'm just going to show you what's here. What you can do is download the slide set, take a look at it. Actually, what I would do personally, I would do is I recreate this, <laughs> and then put the code into the project. You can actually see it work, which might make more sense. In fact, I probably have this for you already, but I don't want to give it to you. I'd rather have you do it, actually. But uh, the edit text, the checkbox itself is this guy here. There's just nothing more than a check on it. When you press on it, the, air, the, the, the um, image changes from one image to another image. So this image is clear or it's gray. The other image is probably green or red or something. So you can tell when the box has been checked. And uh, Where's the checkbox? Here it is, a checkbox. Yeah, it's switching the image, so we have selected, and it's going to send up a message, actually, too. It sends up a toast message, actually, when it's selected and not selected. So a lot of the special effects are nothing more than swapping images out on buttons once an on-click event has been captured, and we're switching the image to something else. The radio buttons are these guys on the bottom here, and these usually comes in multiple sets. And so we can put them in a group. If we put them in a group, then we can control when we click this one, then click that one doesn't get clicked or something, because we can only select one or something. So the radio buttons are here. So we have radio buttons that we're going to give to red, the blue, to different colors. And then an on-click listener, uh, so that something happens essentially when we click the red, it turns off the blue. So we have one that's selected or not selected, and we can swap between the two of them. Toggle buttons, uh, so we can toggle. Which the toggle is on the check button, probably underneath it. Let's see. Oops. This is the toggle. This is, you asked about the toggle button. The toggle button is this guy here. It says vibrate off. When we click on it, it's going to say vibrate on. And uh, so if it's checked versus unchecked, uh, vibrate. So text on is vibrate on. Text off is vibrate off. So when you click it on, click it off, and then what you're going to do is keep track of the two states with an on-click listener, and the on-click listener is going to be, is it checked or is it not checked? And then it's going to pop up a little toast message that says, hey, you checked it, you didn't check it, stuff like that. The rating bar is an interesting one, actually. Hardly anyone uses it, but, uh, or actually a lot of people use it. Rate, rate your app or whatever, you know, number of stars. It's nothing more than capturing clicks. So you put as many stars as you want out there, <laughs> and your capture clicks on each one of the stars, so you can get a final rating here. And this number of stars was set to five, so we saw five stars out there. And we just put a rating bar five, and then we can go, you know, to set an on rating bar change listener. How many? How many are checked? Two, three, four. That we can capture that event. And here's a hello world with a web view. As I mentioned before, it's easy actually. We just put a different view out there. This one's called a web view. We make a window for a web view for viewing the web pages. And here's what it looks like actually. In the XML layout, we can drag it over or we can actually just programmatically put it in here. And uh, we're going to set 
the object, the GUI item, is a web view. It's a special form of a view that we can stick inside of a layout. And when we set the layouts, excuse me, when we set the parameters, there's not very much to set for it. We can give it a URL to start with, but we're going to do it programmatically in the on create. So web view, my web view, as an example, create an instance of that web view or of a web view object. And then we're going to get find view, find view by ID, get the view, assign it to the local reference to the web view object, and then set the URL here with web view. So get settings, enable Java, I don't know, enable other features of the web view that can be done through different methods that are done on the web view. And then webview.load URL to load, let's say, um, jo uh, Google. And uh, that all that one five different lines of code creates this, actually. And it automatically formats it for mobile devices as well. So if you actually do that and navigate to a website, it'll actually give you the mobile version of the website automatically as well. Uh, but here's our basic small amount of code for a lot of functionality, essentially. If you know how to use a web view, <laughs> I mean, if you know that a web view exists, actually. And then here's the Android uh, manifest where we actually have to uh, set the activity and give permission. And here's an example of using permissions. And I have a, an example that I'm going to show you that uh, creates a web view, essentially. And um, if someone reminds me of that, I can probably do that first so you guys see it. Because that's the most exciting one, I think, actually. Um, here we're going to set the permission. And all of the permissions start out this way. They go android.permissions. Android and then it'll say file, read, internet, um, something else. <laughs> Depends on what permission you're setting. Yeah. Uh, but they all come in the same format, and they're all tags that are set in the Android manifest. If you don't set the permission to allow internet access, you'll get that, uh, sorry, your application died unexpectedly. You're not going to get very much out of it. If you run it, it looks like that. So. For the web view, there's actually a map key, and I'll run through this in a lot more detail because this we're finally caught up with the we're finally caught up now with the uh, powerpoints, so I can start showing you this. Um, I have an example that I'm going to show you. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit it in on Monday unless I start with it. But uh, you go out, and you fill out a little form, you cut and paste a little code you get from your computer, you put it in the form, you get what's called an API key. You take the API key, you put it in the um, XML file for the web view and it opens up the web view and allows the access. Why they have this? I have no idea. It's to control the access, I guess. I'm not sure. But uh, we'll run through signing up for a map API key. It's free. There's no expense for it. You do it once per computer and every program that you create on your computer uses the same key and so you can just de deploy applications that use it and uh, essentially have a working web view interface. So, Okay, that's enough for tonight. <laughs> that's a lot of PowerPoints. But we are actually caught up to date, and you're not going to see any PowerPoints on Monday. Instead, what I'm going to do is show you examples of all that stuff I just went through. So, Monday, we're going to do views, map view, web view. Uh, actually, that was web view we saw. We didn't see map view. I probably won't do map view. Web view. We'll do map view on a later date. A um, ton of different apps that show all the different components with all the different GUI. So GUI. So money will be based on GUI and components. Not as much programming, but more plug and play with the GUI components in the XML. Okay. Thank you. See you next time.